in both and it already is spitting out a Lambert inside of um, yeah inside of Maya um, just go with that uh, because the Lamberts and the Blinds and the Fongs don't render that awesome inside of Arnold You know, so that's the only uh, drawback of them. You basically cater the material to how you plan to render it. So if I'm in Unity, and chances are it, it'll bring it over as a quote-unquote Lambert by name, but it's a Unity material, and then you're going to tweak it out to what the engine is allowing and how you have the engine set up. So you're going to have to change it anyway. Even when I spit things over from Maya as an FBX into Unreal, Unless, you know, I, I already assume I'm going to have to recreate the material itself. And I want to, so I don't know about Unity, but in Unreal I make what's called master materials. So I make maybe four or five of those, and then I make what's called instance materials off of them. So when I build a master material, I design that material with parameters that I can change. So I might have one as a metal, one as a skin, one is a uh, cloth and I build everything I need into it and then I just make instances of it that don't harness tons of resources and then I can change their color, their translucency, their shininess, uh, even swap out materials but I don't have to keep recreating a new material, I just instance it and it doesn't use uh, the same amount of resources. So I take a little bit more time to set up a master material and then I just make instances of everything to, to vary it up, and it saves me a lot of time. Which I'm pretty sure you could probably, you might be able to do in Unity, depending on what package you'd have or download. Oh, come on, where are you? Substance. Assuming that Painter loads up, it's taking its own sweet time. Uh, while I'm waiting for that to load up, and I may have to double check and make sure it's, may just have to do a restart, it's acting weird. When you guys are building stuff, whether it's for the, for this class or for um, particularly your game design class, you want to, th uh, have you guys gone over modular design at all? Oh. Yeah, 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 I think we did with the, the, the building. Yeah, so I showed you a little bit of that, but uh, this is something I built um, with the idea of pulling it in. Yes? Is modular design something similar to uh, building interior modeling? Uh, it's whatever you're building with. External, internal. Nope. You just keep them modular even at the very end? Absolutely. Because it seems like, uh, let's say it's in a game, there might be like scenes, and then someone like object glitching, glitch through the floor and fall forever. Not if you do it right. And that's the biggest thing. There are ways to get around that. Number one, when you model these pieces, you model them to scale so they snap together and there is no gaps. Okay? So when I build something... I model it out with a specific uh, design, like if I go, let's say, to a front view, and I'm going to isolate this object. So this object is a specific size. If I turn on the grid or if I use my measurement tools, um, 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 um. yes, and then I can snap them on the grid in my game engine and I have the pivot point ultimately would be somewhere like right here 
here. This? Nope. Because it's, see, it's an inset of the model. So that when I have this, just so you can see. So when you did that, did you use a reflective technique so that you only had to design one side and then copy the other side over? Occasionally I'll do that. For these, they're pretty simple. I just modeled it together. You know, like just, and then I also didn't want it necessarily perfectly mirrored. So you'll notice that one side has the inset that I could put pipes and stuff, and the other side doesn't. Yeah. So if I build this, right, all these pieces, then when I duplicate it, duplicate it, hold down V, snap, see? Yep. And if there is a seam, I hide them. How do I hide them? So here's one piece. Here's the other piece. Here's the bulkhead that hides the seam. Right? I also don't make these all one piece. And the benefit, then I can just start to intersect and put these guys together and make bases that will go on to them. And build from that. Yep. And then the cool part is I make a few of these pieces and then I just snap them together to make a much larger piece. And in. And then you grab those pieces as like a, like a set of them and then modular with those. Whichever or however you're building it. But this is world building. So essentially, the cool thing is, is that. It makes sense for me to do it this way because I can instance the models inside of at least Unreal. So that when I instance a model, it's not constantly going into uh, the video. The video card isn't saying, how do I draw this? What is this? How do I draw this? What is this? It's already made. So when I duplicate it 20 times, it already knows how to draw it. It's already in memory. Every time I have to pull up a brand new object, Until there's none of them left in the scene, yeah. So even if I duplicate it several times, it's still thinking, I know how to draw this. Um, uh, yeah, you do reach a limit, but it's far greater than if I, every object was unique. You don't want every object in your scene to be absolutely unique whenever possible. You want to swap out textures on the same object. You want to scale the same object in different ways. But you don't, yeah, you don't want to have um, every single texture, every single object unique. You want to reuse things as much as possible and make it look like you're not reusing them. And so when I make this, you know, and I texture this out and... Um, no one is the wiser, see? And then I make contours and stuff so that people can see differences. And I also want to think of the design of functionality, not just this is a hallway. This is a hallway on either a space base or a space station or even a spaceship. And the way that they build things is that if something goes wrong, I have to remove a panel to go behind it or replace just that one piece as opposed to, like if you a building scraps, I have to destroy the whole building. On a spaceship, that makes no sense, right? You only want to remove and repair one small piece at a time and, and have functionality. Um, one question. Um, is that an area light that is at the far end of the hallway over there? Because there is a big amount of light. Um, I just temporarily, it's not, I know, ne I never really truly, uh, I put a bunch of point lights that were actually in place of some of these ceiling light fixtures, but in actuality, this isn't really designed to be rendered inside of here. I mean, I, I, I could, I just haven't lit it that way. This is designed to go in my game engine so I can actually light it inside of there. So I design all these modular pieces, UV map them then texture them, 
make sure they have a light map UV set. And then I would actually go in and just light them inside of uh, the game engine. And that light map is the stuff that's like not moving, it's static, not moving object, right? Yeah, for baked in lighting. And the light's not moving, so you're going to keep that. No. If the object is moving, then use dynamic lights with it. The more you have those. So when I make um, when I make a game level or something like that, I don't have to worry about it when I'm rendering an Arnold. I mean, I could if I'm doing something big, but when you look around the room and you see shadows and highlights that aren't moving, right? In a game engine, uh, real dynamic lighting takes a lot of processing, okay? So what they do is they bake in lights. And they bake it in based off of the lights in the scene and your UV maps. Now, if my UVs are on top of each other for tiling textures and stuff, I can't make a light map off of it because it gets confused. Because one part of the model says it's lit one way and another part says it's lit another. So I have to, if I don't have all my UVs laid out in the zero to one space, not overlapping, then I actually have to have a second UV set that does do that. And when the game engine calculates the lighting, it makes a brand new texture showing the light information on the model and then multiplies it on the model in the game. So that's baked in lighting. So I have a light map UV set that basically says, oh, this shadow's right here. Now in a game engine, I move my hand and you see shadows, I'd be dynamic. So that's real time lighting, but it overlaps, overlays on top of the baked in lighting. So when I'm in a game engine, I have to decide what's static and what's mobile or dynamic. And then I treat them differently. If it's static, like your environment, your buildings, that's baked in, unless I have something like uh, a scene that's changing from day to night or something like that, which is really expensive, but there's also tricks of how they do it. That's dynamic. Anything moving is dynamic. Anything baked is that shadow does not move. Oh, oh, so something would be like a moving light project. Like imagine you're like in a theater and then you have a light projecting upward like an old fancy cinema. As long as it's there's nothing obstructing it, changing it, or the light's not swinging back and forth, which would mean the shadows would move back and forth then it's baked in. If it, any of those elements, like the moment I start to do this and you see my shadow moving, this then I need a dynamic shadow, light and shadow, because otherwise, if it's baked in and I move this, the shadow wouldn't work. And when you, and when, when you mean by dynamic lighting, do you have to control some of the animation in a dynamic light, or the animation would be already taken care of? It's that it calculates on the fly. So whatever it's doing, it's dynamic, it will update. If the light moves back and forth, then the shadow will move back and forth. So just think of it mobile or non-mobile. That's it. It's pretty simple. Just does this move or does it not? And all these lights are incorporated with the arm. Then we're talking game engine. Oh, we're talking game, game engine like Yeah. Game. Arnold, it bakes for every frame. You can bake uh, static lighting if I'm doing a big project. You guys don't need to worry about this because we're not doing that. But I could bake all my lighting in Arnold and then have um, a character calculate dynamic lighting and that would save time. But the only reason you'd want to do that would be if you're doing a big animation and you don't have a render farm and you're trying to save as much physical time as possible. So I would bake all my lighting, static lighting in, and I can do that in, in Maya or whatever. Um, 
but the only time you really need to worry about that is once again if I'm doing a big realistic animation and then I have a dynamic character and I want to save time on my rendering or a static one you could be used for stuff like still mall yeah still or just whatever is yeah whatever's not moving so then if uh, say there's that one two three four five six seven okay mm-hmm someone adds another couple lights in here, they don't update the light map. It's going to keep this lit as if it's like this. Yep. It could be wrong. Right? Yeah. There is a level of people don't notice it looks lit. total reality, okay. though. Okay. If, um, my phone, if it's on my phone, it's like, okay, it looks kind of lit, but it's like, oh, there's more point lights. It would, it would have more lit from this side. People won't. M unless it's it's blaring, people are not going to scrutinize it. Um, people will scrutinize, like, if I stand underneath here, I'm more lit. Right? And if I go back there, I'm not going to be as lit. You know, as long as things have shadows, I mean, some of you may not have been playing video games quite as long as I have, I can guarantee it. <laughs> but I remember when they first started adding shadows in video games. And they couldn't, the way they did it was just, it wasn't a, an articulated, detailed shadow. It was a gradient circle underneath them. Yeah. Okay? And then all of a sudden that looked realistic because people know you're supposed to have a shadow, otherwise you're floating. Then, as the hardware got more powerful, you're able to get these nice, you know, shadows that are more accurate and fade away from the character but still showing the arms and stuff like that. Most people need a hint of reality to believe things. They don't need the full reality. Right? Um, most people don't acknowledge how light bends through glass, but they acknowledge that light does bend through glass. So that means I don't have to plug in the exact number to get it 100% realistic as long as I have the basics and the slight bend. People are like, oh, that's so real. <laughs> but the actual mathematical computation based on the amount of light and all that stuff, they, they just want a hint of reality. So that's, that's where you can cheat a lot and, and give just enough that it's believable because most people are easy to, you know, Ooh, look, I pulled my finger off. <laughs> it's all, you know, kind of smoke and mirror. So from my experience, how about it light, uh, light, um, lights in Maya, how about it lights in Maya? My understanding sort of is that game engine and Maya not at least just a solid, it, they were, the game engines and these modeling tools were programmed in such a way that they at least know the solid difference between reflections and refractions of light. Now they do. But it once again, it just depends on the style and which game and all that kind of stuff. So it all, at the end of the day, whether you're working Arnold or a game engine, it depends on the style you're going for and how you want to interpret it um, and your resources of how much hardware you have to do it and time. Because reality takes more processing. The more realistic I want to go with something, the more it's going to take longer. Just yes? Just, just like, a, just like a augmented reality. That's a whole other bad <laughs> question. Do you typically filter scenes in Maya with the image so it looks kind of like Unreal, or do you build them in Unreal? No, I build uh, in Maya because when you're working, at least in Maya, and I think to Unity also, you have two options for, for making structures and things and it's either what's referred to as a static mesh which is a model you bring in from Maya or Studio Max or whatever it is or it's um, it, it would be uh, something 
that you would build in the engine, which would be called a, um, a BSP brush, and that's geometry made by the engine. And that's great for blocking out your level or prototyping a level or just getting the layout, but they're not very efficient to actually have as in-game assets anymore. And static meshes calculate way faster. So I might have an idea for a level, block it out real quick with BSPs, and then maybe export that into Maya and then replace those boxes and shapes with real static meshes and then bring those back in. Or I'll just build it entirely in Maya or at least the components of it and then bring them in. Um, and then that way, because I, I model pretty fast and I can actually get it clean just the way I want it and then just pull the stuff in pretty seamlessly. So once I'm pulling it out of Maya, typically most of the stuff is done, you know, at least mesh-wise. I may still have to texture it, but I just start throwing the things in the game engine and getting it set up. So would you do that for the entire level or just for individual components? Like one piece of the hallway or the entire hallway? The entire hallway? Um, personally, I like to mock things out in Maya first. Um, and then, but when I go to, like, if I were taking this into Unreal, I wouldn't send this whole thing out. I would send out, oh, all hallway, section A, you know, section B with the door, uh, section C, which is the L curve to the, you know, which I can, if I rotate it 90 degrees, will turn left. And then I might have a T frame. That, that is like an X that I can hook and have four hallways connect to. And maybe one or two more variations or rooms that, that would also connect to them. And then I'd export those out and just build it out inside of there. Um, so I would build the components. I'm checking them inside of here to see how they look and how they work and their scale and all that good stuff, and I have George in here. Where are you? There you are. To make sure that he fits, you know, make sure, like, this doorway. Can you see it has, like, this inset here? Here. And then what I can do is, like, the idea is that this is going to, you know, and then when they close, and this one comes in, just like that. And this, of course, would be like spinning or whatever while it's doing that, you know, if I wanted to. Quick question. Do you, have, do you ever design like an AutoCAD format, a spin, or do you just stay with Maya? Maya. Uh, AutoCAD, AutoCAD is good, but I'm not being that realistic. I'm being artistic. Um... I, I've seen people where they build stuff out in AutoCAD and bring it in, and it's usually like an architect or something. Um, I'm not an architect. I just play one on TV. So when I'm actually building it out, I know enough of structures and observation to make something feasible that looks realistic. But, you know, it's sort of like, but I don't need it to be so architecturally sound that it could realistically be built from these materials that don't exist <laughs> in real life. Right, so it would be more like mm -hmm. building houses and, uh, and autocad. Um, it's more for if you want to be exceptionally detailed to the millimeter of, of building a structure. Uh, is when I'd use AutoCAD, where if I'm off by an inch, it could cost millions or have a building fall. I'm not worried about that, <laughs> you know. So that that would basically be it. Now, if I knew AutoCAD well enough that I could just go in, I might, but I don't see any point to using it at this point. Um, I think speaking of um, very detailed, I think AutoCAD, since it was invented, and I believe until 2010, AutoCAD was mostly just a 2D tool made just like a blueprint tool. It's for blueprint. It's literally, it's designed for architects and um, engineers who are building things that have to be 
a hundred percent accurate before they go into production because if they don't it could cost lives if i make this and it's a millimeter or an inch off the only thing that's going to die is a virtual character <laughs> not an engine blowing up because the piece doesn't fit right or a building falling because the structural support it this is all cosmetic um this is fantasy so i don't i'm not worried about that level of detail it, this world works by the physics that i give it not real world <laughs> question Until you make them, yeah. I mean, physically in real world. But, yeah. Cool. So let me, actually, I'm just going to. 